to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We're going to read one of the stanzas of Psalm 119. We're going to read verses 97 through 104. Psalm 119. Verse 97. David writing says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandment makes me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil way in order to keep your word. I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through your precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every false way. This is God's word. I'm going to ask Tim Paver if you would come and pray for us as we, as we hear God's word today. Let us pray. Dear Father, thank you for the opportunity to worship you in a safe and public place. Mm. And thank you for being our supreme Father. Yes. Please open our hearts today to the word. I pray for encouragement and endurance as we go about our lives. That way me that we may better reflect you and better serve your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Well, how many of you ever heard of <clears throat> home field advantage before? You heard of that? In both college and professional sports, the team that plays on the home field, of course, has an advantage over the visiting team because the the field or the court is familiar. They don't have the added stress of traveling somewhere, and and they're playing in front of unfavorable fans. um, And there's lots of stories you could look at in sports through the years of, of teams that had home field advantage. The Boston Celtics at the Boston Garden where they used to play. Uh, the visitor's locker room was very, very small, they say, had poor heating, Boston, in the middle of the winter, and the showers were really, really short. <laughs> now think about that. There's a lot of tall basketball players, and they'd have to be under there going like this. It gives them a little bit of an advantage. Um, the New York Giants, they tell me, used to actually leave a, a specific door open when they would be kicking, the other team would be kicking field goals to let the breeze come through and kind of maybe tweak the kick a little bit. <laughs> And the Los Angeles Dodgers used to actually wet the base path so that it would slow runners down. All these things are kind of, they give home field advantage. And I say that because when you think about our lives as believers in this world, we really do live at a disadvantage, don't we? I mean, we live in hostile territory. Um, we, we are dealing every day with an ungodly and, and sometimes even antagonistic culture towards the things of Christ. And, and unfortunately, many Christians, because of that, approach life with fear and uncertainty because of their negative mindset of the world around us. Here's what we need to learn today is that the Bible really levels the playing field for Christians in our world. You see, the Bible is the great equalizer, and it assures us not only of where the world is heading, but it also guarantees Jesus' ultimate victory over the powers of darkness. They said it this way. When I grew up, they said it this way. You hear people say, I read the back of the book and we win. Well, I like to say it this way. I read the back of the book and Jesus wins. And so it gives us a hope. When our text today, David gives us his theme in verse 97. He says, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. In other words, David 
loves God's word in a big way. And think about some of the other ways David said that. He said that God's word was his delight. He said that God's word, in it he finds wonderful things. He said it's like music to him. He said it is better than silver or gold. He said it's like finding great treasure in verse 162. So the question for us is simply this today. Do you love God's word? Do you love it? I mean, how do you answer that question? Do I love God's word? David says, oh, how I love your law. And then he gives us some reasons why he loves God's word and why we should love it too. The first thing he gives us is this. The word of God gives us wisdom for life. You see, this is our, our, our mission statement. I forgot to say it together, but that's okay. But we're looking at cherishing Scripture mightily. And we do that because God's Word gives us wisdom for life. In this verse, several things, some things are mentioned three times. One thing specifically. It's that God's Word gives us wisdom. Notice the phrase, he's going to be wiser. He's going to have more understanding, or he understands more. Now, when you look at those things, specifically in verses 98 through 100, you realize, well, David is talking about being wiser than his enemies. And, and we can understand that because his enemies were people who did not love God's word. But then he talks about being wiser than his teachers and being wiser than the aged. And you wonder, well, wait a minute. That seems kind of strange. Why would he say that? I mean, is he just being arrogant? He's just being boastful and saying, hey, I know more than the people who taught me. I think a lot of uh, seminary students have that verse memorized. You know what? I'm, I know more than my teachers. But being arrogant and boastful about it, that almost seems like it's the opposite of wisdom, doesn't it? So what's going on? Remember, David is talking about his enemies. And, and when he talks about his enemies, he's talking about those who do not love God's word the way he does. And so when he talks about his teachers and his elders, he's speaking of teachers and elders who also do not love God's word the way that he does. See, God's wisdom is far superior than man's wisdom. And, and if you learn what God says, what you find out is you'll know things that people who don't know God's word have never discovered. Now, this pra- passage is so practical for us because in life we live in this culture where not only is God's word not cherished like we're saying we want to, but honestly God's word is often mocked and it's often hated. And so if we're going to live for confidence, with confidence in this world, if we're going to live for Christ in this world, we need a confidence And we need the same confidence David had, a confidence in God's word. And so in this passage, I want you to see three lessons that David learned that can help us to live confidently for Christ in our world today. Lesson one, David is saying this. He's saying he's learned that the word makes him wiser than his enemies, which causes him to triumph. See, David triumphed over Goliath because he understood he could not put confidence in in the arm of the flesh. David triumphed over Saul because he knew that you should never touch God's anointed. David triumphed over Absalom because he had discovered the secret of spiritual power that comes through prayer. And where did he learn these things? He learned these things in God's word. I read a story this week about a man named Jeffrey Bull. I think I have a picture of him here. The picture, there you go, Jeffrey Bull. He was an English missionary to Tibet. And he was arrested by the Chinese army in 1950. He was sent to a Chinese prison camp. And for three years, he was forced to live without a Bible. They took his Bible from him. And what they had hoped to do was to cut off his source of spiritual strength and his his source of spiritual peace. But here's the thing. For years, this man had been storing God's word in his heart. He had been in God's Word. He had been reading God's Word. He had been memorizing God's Word. And he had made it a part of his life, and it was in his heart. They even began to brainwash him. And so he describes the the nagging and the noise, the scrutiny, the spying, the tension. He tells them how they would threaten him with execution. Uh, And they would would always threaten him, not only that, but, but if he would turn from what he said he believed and confess his crimes against the people, then they'd set him free and they'd pardon him. But it never worked. And and this tension was aggravated. They constantly baited him. They attacked him. They attacked his self-respect, his integrity. I mean, they, they, they tried to brainwash him, prying into his thoughts. It was a terrible thing. He was constantly, constantly, day after day, month after month, year after year, argued, 
criticized, struggled, and every moment he was under intense scrutiny. Could you imagine living like that? They kept at it. They kept at it for three years. And for f- the, the guards kept at it because they were afraid they'd lose their lives if they didn't. But there was nothing they could do. Although they tried their best to bring him, and to brainwash him into captivity to Marxism, it never worked. And in the end, listen to this, they gave him his Bible back because they realized it just wasn't going to work. So he describes exactly what he felt when they, the first time they gave him his Bible back and he held it in his hands. He describes the feeling he had, the ecstasy he had. He said, ringing in my ears for over 40 months of man's words, man's wisdom, man's arguments, man's hurt. And now on the pages before me ran the quiet yet powerful words of Scripture which said, where is the wise Where is the disputer of this world? And he said, long after his release, even today I feel like running up and down the corridors of learning and shouting out, yes, where is the the wise? He said, after years of being harangued and, 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 and just bothered by these Marxists, he asked, where is the wise? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? See, his tormentors, they did what they did because of hatred. But his mind was sharpened by God's word. He was wiser than his enemies because he loved God's word and he cherished it. So that's what David is saying. He said, I'm wise. the word makes me wiser than my enemies and causes me to triumph. The second lesson he teaches is this, is that the word makes us wiser than our teachers, which frees us from humanism. You know, here, listen to what the psalmist is saying Not that he'll have more knowledge than his teachers. I mean, we don't have a promise in the Bible that we can go out and argue with a a secular professor with a PhD in a university and win. It's not that idea. But what we do have is the Bible promises that we can have God's wisdom. So the goal of Scripture is not just to make us clever and smart, but it's to make us wise so that we might know what God is doing. In Jesus' life, by the time he was 12 years old, He was, you know, the the story is in Luke chapter 2 where he goes into the temple and he went away from his family and they found him and they ask him, they see him sitting with these doctors and these lawyers asking questions and the Bible says he was confounding them with his wisdom. These rabbis, they were book smart. They were educated. They had incredible knowledge. They had read commentaries. They they, They just were smart people. And yet they were confounded by Jesus' wisdom. Why? Because he was solely impacted by God's word. And so the Bible gives us this understanding, this wisdom of human behavior that even surpasses any kind of human philosophy. And it enables us to face life and death with assurance because we know what God says. And the third lesson David teaches us is this, that the word makes us wiser than our aged, than, than the elders. Why? Because it delivers us from traditionalism. Now please understand, There is a tendency within the church movement in our world for truth to gradually be replaced by tradition. And it's not that traditions are wrong. Please understand that. Traditions are good, and some traditions are really good, but what happens is sometimes traditions gradually begin to become more important than Bible truth. And that is called traditionalism. And and we should learn from the past. We should absolutely uh, learn from the experience of the church through the ages, but we always have to measure everything against the word of God. Jesus spent time confronting the traditionalism of the Pharisees. And he says in Mark 9, 7, he says to these people, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your own tradition. when When we as a church seek what God wants us to do and how he wants us to do it, every church has to be so careful that our measuring stick is not our opinions. It is not our preferences. It's not how we used to do it. Rather, we measure everything against God's word to see what God's plan for his church is. And then, honestly, we just obey what he says to do. We follow him. And so we have to be so careful that it is the word that guides us, not just traditionalism. So God gives us wisdom through his word. That's one of the reasons we cherish it. Secondly, We cherish God's word because it protects us from evil. 
Verse 101, David says, I have kept back my feet from every evil way. So when you read a verse like that, what that tells us is that there is an evil way, and conversely, there's also a good way. There's a godly way. And that goes so against the spirit of our age, where everybody thinks any way you want to live is totally fine. And do what you want and be happy, and that's all that matters. In fact, I mean, maybe your children have said this. I've even heard, you know, Jace, Jace can make us laugh sometimes, I have to tell you. He, he's, he's a riot sometimes. And every once in a while, when we're talking to him, you know, we'll be like, Jace, this, 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 and this. And you know what he often says? He looks at it and goes, it's all good. <laughs> and it's hard not to laugh at that. You know, a little smile and everything. And, and we hear people say that it's all good. But some people mean by that, that everything's okay. Whatever you want to do is fine. It's all good. Don't worry about it. But here's the truth. This verse clearly implies that there are situations and people and temptations that we should stay away from. In our lives, there's got to be a guiding influence. There's got to be an authority. There's got to be something that guides us through the winding roads of life. I think about it. JJ um, is, what are you, 14? He's going to be 15 soon. Which you know what that means? It means he gets to get that little driver's permit and I got to teach him how to drive I want I, I'm tempted to teach him R means drive go ahead go see no but but I think about back when my my stepdad was teaching me how to drive sometimes here they have a lot of hours at night that you have to do and I don't remember having that many hours at night um, because but here it's dark especially during the winter but I remember when my stepdad did take me to drive at night the lights from the other cars would just shine on you. And I always thought they all had their head beams on me. You know what I mean? But it was just natural. They were just driving. And, and, and it's almost like when you're driving, you know, they talk about a deer in the headlights. You kind of feel like that at first when you're driving. Like you're almost steering towards them. Go to the light. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so my, my eyes would be on the lights. And my dad would tell me, no, don't look at the lights. He taught me to look at the lines on the road. Either one. Either the middle line or this line. Let them be your guide and stay in between there, and you'll be fine. And you know what? That's exactly what the Word does for us. It keeps us in the lines of what God wants for us. Think about it this way. You see, the Word teaches me what displeases God. I mean, no doubt, we can do things, we can go places, we can be tempted, and it is the influence of the Word of God that keeps us away from evil, keeps us on the straight path. Psalm 119 says it this way, How can a young man make his way pure? By guarding it according to your Word. John Bunyan said it best, and you've all heard this, This book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. The idea there is this, if we cherish God's Word... God will use it to keep us from sin. Now, I understand. Sometimes we think, well, I know I should be reading the Bible, but it's hard, and, and I'm not a reader, and so I don't retain it. I'm going to tell you, I have a problem retaining the things I read. I always have all my life. I have a terrible reading retention problem. Sometimes I can read something, and I have no idea what I've read. And sometimes you feel like you're wasting your time because I don't get it. But let me tell you something. Even when you feel like you're not getting it, we are not wasting our time because God's word is unlike anything else. D.L. Moody said it this way. He said, the only way to keep a broken vessel full is by keeping the faucet turned on. And so keeping God's word running repeatedly through our minds and our hearts, consistently keeping it in there and running it through there will help us to stay away from the things that displease God. This book will keep us from sin or sin will keep us from this book. The second thing is this. The Word also teaches me what pleases God. Everybody lives to please somebody. I mean, everybody does. And, and most people live to please themselves. But here's the thing. Pleasing God ought to be the major motivation for our Christian life. The Holy Spirit works in our lives both the will and the do of His good pleasure. And Jesus said, I always do the things which please my Father. The question is, how do we know what pleases God? It's the same way we know what pleases our earthly father. We listen to him and we live with him. And as we read God's word, as we grow in a relationship with God, we get to know the heart of God. And this opens our hearts up to the will of God. 
As Paul told the church of Thessalonica, he said this, Finally then, brethren, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you have received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as are you, you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. As Christians, folks, we have a guidebook. But that's not all. We not only have a guidebook. We were watching, my family and I, you know, you, everybody knows we like superheroes. We were watching The Flash the other night, because that's what we do. And um, a commercial came on for the next week, and they built The Flash a new suit. And it does all these weird mechanical things. And he's like, how am I going to know how to use it? He grabs a big binder and says, here, I wrote you an owner's manual. And it's like, you ever, I mean, have you ever tried to put things, I hate putting things together for Christmas. How about you guys? <laughs> oh, you got to follow, and it doesn't make sense. And oh. You're left alone sometimes to do that. Here's what's great. We not only have a guidebook, but we also have a guide. And that guide wrote the book. And we have the privilege of having a relationship with him. And he can teach us how to live. Listen, we not only are required to follow the instructions he left for us, but he works in us to do it. And when we do that, we understand God's plans. We can begin to influence others to do the same. So listen, it gives us wisdom. It keeps us from evil. And then lastly, it provides great joy. Psalm 103 talks about honey, how the word was like honey to his lips. In those days, honey was the universal sweetener. It was kind of like sugar or any kind of artificial sweetener we might use today. What David is saying is he has a sweet tooth for God's word. I've heard people say this. I've heard Jeannie say this sometimes. We'll be in the office and we'll be doing a bunch of work and she'll just... <laughs> Jeannie's hilarious. She'll just say, she'll say, Joel! Yes, Jeannie. I need chocolate! So I lock my door because I know that means if she doesn't get chocolate, it's going to be a problem. I mean, when he talks about having the, the word being sweet to his taste, being like honey, we might think that's a little bit strange that he would describe it that way, but think about it this way. When we read the Bible, we read God's words. And as we do, as we ponder the words of God's of God, as we ponder the words of the Bible, one by one, phrase by phrase, line upon line, precept upon precept, we take time to think it through, it does, it becomes sweet to us. Now, when I was a kid, um, they, the 80s were a fun time to grow up. They did a lot of weird things. And I remember, sometimes I tell my kids, you did what? When I was a kid, they had this candy, I don't know if they still have it, but it was called the Everlasting Gobstopper. How many of you remember that? It was, it was supposed to be, I, so, I think they used to call them a uh, ultimate jawbreakers or something. They made the everlasting gobstopper. And it's this big, huge thing that was like almost the size of a golf ball and probably harder than a golf ball. And you put it in your mouth and you weren't supposed to bite it because you'd break your teeth. And so we didn't. So what you would do is you'd put it in your mouth, you'd let it dissolve slowly. I mean, for hours it would be in your mouth. I think some teacher somewhere invented this so that their <laughs> kids would keep quiet and not talk during class. Because you ever try to talk with a big thing? <laughs> you sound like Rocky Balboa talking. It's terrible. <clears throat> and if you ever tried to put a couple of them in your mouth, you'd spit them all out because you couldn't breathe. You'd have spit coming everywhere. So here's what you had to do. You had to just take your time and let it just salivate. Let it just melt inside your mouth and you'd get all that sweetness and all that candy and, and probably destroy your heart by doing it. <laughs> and your teeth, yes, absolutely. But here's what I'm trying to say. Listen to what, Jer think about that as you read Jeremiah's words on the screens. Jeremiah says, your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. The word should not be a drudgery for us. God's word shouldn't be something that we think we have to get involved in. It ought to bring us great joy like it did with David, who delighted in it. David could not get enough of God's word. And that ought, you know, and he had this in great joy. And we can have the same if we will delight ourselves in God's word, as we say, if we will cherish scripture mightily. Now let me close with this. I gave these to you in your bulletin, and I want you to take these, and here's some action steps. How can we help ourselves to fall in love with God's Word? Number one, read it. I mean, that might seem simple. Why would you even say that? Because we need to read it. It's a book. God gave us a book. The Bible says, 
faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. I mean, we, we, we have to apply ourselves. There's something we do have to do. We're not taught the word simply by osmosis. It's not like God sits there and goes, all right, you're a Christian now, zap, here you go, you know the Bible. We have to read it, we have to spend time with it. And even if we struggle, and I know that some people really do struggle, it's God's word. It's not like Time Magazine or a novel. It's God's word, and God can teach us his word. So read it. Number two, think about it. Joshua says that we ought to meditate on it day and night, that we're, we can do what God asks us to do. See, what we fill our minds with will eventually fill our hearts. So this week, spend some time thinking about God's word, pondering God's word, mulling over it, meditating on it, thinking about what does this mean for my life? What is God trying to tell me? Think about it. Number three, memorize it. I've stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you, David says. Keeping God's word in our hearts, it does keep us from sin like we've talked about. And that ought to inspire us to memorize scripture. But not only that, we want God to work in our lives and God works through his word so memorize it. I love it when, um, when I hear people, when you're talking to people, and they just they say, well, the Bible says this, and this is what I'm claiming for this. That's what we ought to be doing. And so this week, I mean, learn a new Bible verse this week. Make it a point. Second, uh, third, fourthly, excuse me, talk about it. Deuteronomy 6, 7 says that we ought to talk of God's word when we sit in our house, when we walk by the way, when we lie down, when we rise. In other words, it ought to be on our lips. Just like it is in our hearts, it ought to be on our lips. We ought to talk about it. When God teaches you something, tell someone about it. I love it. It thrills me when someone comes to me and they say, let me tell you what God told me in his word today. That just thrills my heart to hear that. Tell someone about God's word. Talk about it. When God tells you, Tell others. And so let's bring the truth of God's word into our conversations this week. Number five, pray over it. Psalm 119, I, I pray this prayer often. Psalm 119, verse 18. David says, open my eyes that I may hold, behold wondrous things from your law. Again, God's word is not like any other book. We have the author living within us. Ask him to teach us. Pray over it. And then the last thing is simply this. Obey it. Do what it says. James 1.22 says, Don't just be a hearer of the word, but be a doer of the word. Obey what God says we're supposed to do in his word. God blesses obedience. And so this week, as God speaks to you and you talk about it, you think about it, you pray about it, and God says, Here's what I want for your lives. Let's do it together. You know what? God's given us an incredible book. It's called the Bible. We want to cherish it. We want to love it. We want this book to be the center of all that we do. And for our lives, God wants us to know him through his word. So I encourage us all today, let's be a church that loves God's word in a big way. You say, how can we do that? It starts with each one of us saying, God, let me be a person that loves God's word in a big way. Let's pray. Thank you for your word, Lord. As we've talked about it, we've sung about it, we've read from it, Lord Jesus, may we be a people who cherish your word. May we be a people who love your word so much that we're willing to bring it into conversation, that we're willing to pray over it, that we are willing, most importantly, to obey it and live it out in our culture. Lord, may your word be our guide. Thank you for it. Use it, even this week, Lord, and help us to cherish your word in a mighty way. We thank you in Christ's name. Amen. Before they do their song, you guys can come on up. But I know... Uh